Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 57, April 18th to April 24th, 1862. Last week, we talked about the strategic situation in Virginia as McClellan advances the Army of the Potomac to Richmond. We also had the fall of Fort Pulaski, with an emphasis on the advancements in artillery against brick forts on full display. This week, we will spend a majority of our time to head down to the Crescent City. Things will keep getting worse for the Confederates in the West there. First, though, I have a few scattered events, including one in North Carolina, but I do want to head back over to Virginia and actually cover an event that was technically last week. This would be the Battle of Dam Number 1, probably the largest action at Yorktown in April. Before we get into Dam Number 1, though, I do want to briefly talk about the Patreon content that should be coming out here very shortly, if it has not already dropped in the Patreon feed uh, this week, in honor of us wrapping up our New Mexico campaign. Uh, We will be doing a movie review, and this one is actually going to be The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Now, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, uh, you might be asking, and it's a fair question, is is probably a Western. Uh, However, if you remember that movie, it is set with this backdrop in the American Civil War. So it's interesting. There are some parts of the movie where that is a big plot point, And there are some parts in the movie where we have some talk of historical events or figures. Uh, So I just want to watch it again and kind of briefly talk about those. And you ultimately, uh, this one's sort of for me, I I love, I love the movie in general. So um, it'll just be fun to, to talk about and review it as well. So if that's something that interests you, then by all means, please check out the Patreon feed. And that will be dropping shortly. If you recall from last week, I mentioned there were potential probing actions to find a weak spot along the Confederate lines. Not everyone was convinced that the rebels had as many men or as strong a position as John Bankhead Magruder wanted the Federals to believe. There had to be a point that the Federal Army could exploit. And this exploitation could be had at a place called Dam Number 1, which was about midway along the Warwick Line. And if you recall, the Warwick Line is named such because it is conveniently placed along the Warwick River. Originally, this was found by Winfield Scott Hancock at an early point in the siege before Johnson combined with Magruder. So since we mentioned Winfield Scott Hancock, ladies and gents, this is as good a time as any to introduce the man. Hancock was born in Philadelphia in 1824 and attended West Point. He would serve in a variety of areas, eventually winding up in Los Angeles when the war broke out. McClellan would make him a brigadier of volunteers. After the war, he is going to run for president unsuccessfully against James Garfield. Now, you might not have heard of Hancock, but he is most notable for the repulse of Pickett's Charge. It's Hancock's men who do that. So that is his claim to fame. He's also reportedly an expert swearer, uh, according to some accounts. So he has that going for him as well. On April 16th, 1862, the Union Army would advance after a brief exchanging of artillery fire. Around 192 men from several companies of the 3rd Vermont moved to take the Confederate earthworks, which, after advancing across the dam, they were able to do to their amazement. Men of a North Carolina regiment were pushed back, their colonel falling in the action. 
Now at this point, this is where the entire line could have been broken. Baldy Smith is in command in this sector, and he has the regiments to exploit this breakthrough. Smith had been a Vermont native and former commander of the 3rd Vermont. He will rise to the rank of Corps Commander during the war. Amazingly, McClellan is also observing, but provides no feedback and no direction. This action was meant as a probe to test strength. It was not an assault. Lack of support allowed the Confederates a chance to organize a counterattack. An entire Southern Brigade retook the works at a dreadful cost for the Green Mountain Boys. More companies of the 3rd, as well as other supporting regiments, would try to counterattack and retake the lost ground, but they were unsuccessful, their enemy now in strength. Confederate losses were 75 killed and wounded, while the Federals lost some 165, including 23 killed and 51 wounded from the 3rd Vermont. This action was important because it essentially seals the Warwick line until Johnson finally withdraws in May. In Washington, the Lincoln administration would continue to grow impatient. Even Confederate sources were amazed that McClellan did not attack using his superior numbers. On April 19th, we have the continuing of the Carolina Campaign in the Battle of South Mills, also known as the Battle of Camden, which is fairly confusing, especially when researching because there was a arguably more important Battle of Camden in the Revolutionary War. Remember, things are going well for the Union in the Carolinas. The Hatteras and Elizabeth City have fallen, and Fort Macon is under siege, the final blow coming to this position on April 25th. Ambrose Burnside would command Jesse Reno to destroy some locks on the Great Dismal Swamp Canal. Built during that transportation boom I mentioned back in the first episodes, the 1805 Canal, if you recall, was used to save a vessel from destruction at Elizabeth City. Unfortunately for the Confederates, it was only one, another member of the Mosquito Fleet being too wide to pass and was burned instead. Reno will have 3,000 for this purpose, as opposed to around 900 Confederate defenders under Ambrose Wright. Reno would land his men a few miles below Elizabeth City, part of his supply train including explosives, that would be used to destroy the locks. The plan was to divide forces and then converge on the rebel position. But part of Reno's force, in the early morning hours, is led astray by a local guide. Remember, there are plenty of northern sympathizers in North Carolina, but this was apparently not one of them. Reno's force would make contact with well-entrenched rebels, exchanging artillery fire for some time. The portion of his troops who went in the wrong direction, which included the 9th New York, or Hawkins Zouaves, would eventually link up with the rest of the Federals. Wright would withdraw his men after an unsuccessful assault on his position. A new line was formed, also with defensive works. Reno's men were exhausted after forcing the Confederates back. Reno would move his forces back to Elizabeth City, having met this resistance. Union losses were 13 killed and around 100 wounded, with the Confederates only losing 6 killed and 19 wounded. Reno's men would do a little looting in their withdrawal, but the rebels had won at least a small victory as opposed to the continuing defeats they had suffered so far in the Outer Banks. 
No Confederate ironclads were transported via the canal, which was the major fear, probably because the CSS Virginia was too wide. That does actually bring us to an interesting point. There were legitimate fears that should the ironclad escape containment, it would wreak havoc in other areas. And this canal, although not practical for that purpose, was at least something that lingered in the back of the Federal Army Command's minds. Like, what if the CSS Virginia was able to pop in around Elizabeth City and then potentially destroy the fleet that they had gathered there with Burnside? That'd be quite a shock for Lewis Goldsboro, who, if you recall, had been accused of cowardice abandoning the Hampton Roads region in order to direct operations with Burnside there in the Carolinas. So uh, I just think that would sort of be comical to having escaped that and then you get the CSS Virginia there anyway, but I will let you be the judge of that. On April 21st, we have the passing of a law in the Confederate States known as the Partisan Ranger Act. It read, Section 1, the Congress of the Confederate States of America do enact that the President be, and he is hereby authorized to commission such officers as he may deem proper with authority to form bands of partisan rangers in companies, battalions, or regiments to be composed of such members as the President may approve. Section 2. Be it further enacted that such partisan rangers, after being regularly received in the service, shall be entitled to the same pay, rations, and quarters during the terms of service, and be subject to the same regulations as other soldiers. Section 3. Be it further enacted that for any arms and munitions of war captured from the enemy by any body of partisan rangers and delivered to any quartermaster at such place or places may be designated by a commanding general, the rangers shall be pay their full value in such manner as the Secretary of War may prescribe. So let's backtrack and see exactly what this means. The Partisan Ranger Act was spurred by the need to gain back the territory lost in Western Virginia, among other places. Confederate leaders, including Jefferson Davis, saw irregular activity as a means to gain back the lost area. This would mean guerrilla fighting in case we were unaware. Irregular operations such as guerrilla fighting would do much to unnerving Union troops in various occupying areas. As we heard in Section 3, Union stores could be bought back by the Confederate government as listed. So here is the benefit if you were planning on becoming a partisan ranger. There's also potentially this added benefit there in Section 2, where you are subject to the rules and regulations of the Army. So you're a regular soldier as opposed to just a criminal, right? Like, that might protect you from potential execution should you be captured there, right there in that section. Eventually, this act would be lifted in 1864. A side effect of this act would be to potentially see the Confederates gain in manpower. If they were to employ irregular units, then maybe some men who did not wish to join the regular army would still go toward the war effort against the Union. In the memoir review of John O. Castler, he decides at the end of the conflict turn toward a guerrilla unit as opposed to stay in the infantry. 
the Confederate Army will move toward allowing its soldiers to change branches in an effort to help prevent desertions, especially after they pass conscription. So you have maybe those who are less willing to join the army being pulled into it. The repealing of the act did not end partisan activities, though, and a lot of their actions do go outside of the normal conventions of war. So they would be violent, especially in certain situations, toward civilians or collaborators. Even in the Kassler memoir, there are examples of retaliation against those with Northern sympathy. When last we left off in the New Orleans area, we had the Battle of the Head of Passes. Despite the blockade forming around the city, nothing much has been happening. In 1862, David Dixon Porter would come up with an idea to capture the largest city of New Orleans. His plan was especially liked by Gustavus Fox, who presented to Gideon Wells and was ultimately approved by the president. His plan was not very different from the blueprint already being implemented by the Navy in other areas. Confederate works would be rendered by accurate mortar fire, allowing for the steaming up of the Mississippi River by the rest of the regular Navy. Specifically, the target would be two forts in a bend of the river a couple of miles south of the city. Forts Jackson and St. Philip were both of the older brick stock, being completed around 1832. In fact, St. Philip had been used during the British invasion. These were stronger positions, although St. Philip being on the north bank of the river was vulnerable from a waterway known as the Quarantine from its rear. Jackson was a bit stronger, being a full star fortification, defending the river and landward approach. Between the forts was a chain boom blocking the river. There had been previous obstructions, but all had been washed away. Also up the Confederate sleeves were rafts soaked in turpentine that could be lit on fire against wooden vessels. All in all, it was going to be a taller task, and one that, despite it being his plan, Porter would not take the lead on. Instead, it would fall to his adoptive brother, Flag Officer David Farragut. Farragut was a Tennessee native turned Virginia resident, having served in the Navy starting in 1810. While a young man, he had moved to live with David Dixon Porter's father, making the two officers foster brothers. Farragut would have under his command 24 warships with an additional 17 mortar craft. This force was being assembled on a place called Ship Island off the Mississippi coast. Ground troops would fall under the command of Benjamin Butler. Manpower in the Crescent City, as we have mentioned, was drained to provide men for Johnson's Shiloh campaign. Mansfield Lovell was given the task of defending the city and had to draw mostly on militia for support. Lovell was a native of Washington, D.C., joining the Army after distinction in the Mexican-American War. In 1862, he commands a hodgepodge of units. One battalion, which is manning the guns at St. Philip and Fort Jackson, is entirely made up of Italian immigrants, illustrating the mix of ethnicity in the city. Men were even pulled from the shipyard building two ironclad vessels, but these were returned after it was realized the necessity of their work. 
Farragut would not have any ironclad vessels, so one equivalent of the CSS Virginia would go a long way. The CSS Louisiana and the CSS Mississippi were being built. The Louisiana being closer to completion, but still not quite ready. It could be possible to potentially use her as a floating battery in desperation. Unfortunately for the Confederate defenders, neither would be ready in time. Lovell had sent Brigadier General Johnson Duncan to command the outer works, which included the two forts. A Pennsylvania native, Duncan had been a civil engineer prior to the war in New Orleans. Johnson will survive captivity, but unfortunately die of sickness shortly afterwards. Once war did break out, he joined the cause for his adoptive state. It is interesting we have two northern-born rebels and one southern-born Yankee squaring off in this encounter. Duncan was a capable officer, but he had made the decision to abandon Ship Island the previous year, which was now being used to stage the naval force the rebels would face. Roughly 1,000 men were split between the two works, probably the best remaining men left to Duncan and Lovell. George Hollins, who had so far been instrumental in the defense of the river, would steam down from Fort Pillow, bringing with him the CSS McRae. Amazingly, because he did so without authorization, he would be removed from his command despite letters pleading for him to stay. This had occurred on April 15th, with Farragut already moving his ships to probe the forts. April 13th and 14th started the bombardment and clearing of the woods of sharpshooters. Duncan decided to withdraw these men back to New Orleans as their fire was relatively ineffective. This was the backdrop that would see George Hollins removed, so needless to say, it was precisely the wrong time. With the sharpshooters cleared of the woods south of Fort Jackson, Farragut was able to move his ships closer to the works. Rafts would be employed by the Confederates, just like at Head of Passes, but they would do little other than give the Union fleet a good scare. By April 16th, there was an exchanging of fire between Jackson and the ships of the fleet. Commander John Mitchell of the Confederate Navy would sail some of his vessels, belonging mostly to the River Defense Fleet, in an effort to show the U.S. Navy that they were willing to fight. Shots were traded, and Farragut would move more of his vessels forward, but there was a little to show for the action. April 18th would show the beginning of the mortar bombardment. Porter had estimated that such fire would force the rebel surrender in 48 hours. Despite hitting the magazine with a shell that failed to explode and knocking several Confederate guns from their positions, this prediction would prove faulty. One mortar vessel was even sunk by return fire. Captain Henry Bell would lead two ships to break the chain across the river, attempting to use a torpedo unsuccessfully but managing to ram the obstruction. This move gave the Confederates anxiety. They would face the risk of having the U.S. Navy run through their forts to get to the city beyond, much as had been done at Island No. 10. In their desperation, the CSS Louisiana was sent to the forts, but Mitchell would not release the ship for use below Jackson and St. Philip, as Duncan requested. Guns were not fully installed, and the ship had no working engine. So it was more of a morale boost than anything. On April 23rd, Farragut would make preparations to run past the forts. This decision came after the several days of bombardment that had showed nothing 
Farragut would lead three vessels, including his flagship, the Hartford, past Jackson, with Bell coming up behind him with an additional six. Eight ships under Captain Theodorus Bailey would then move on the opposite side of the river to fire on St. Philip. Both divisions would inflict damage on the forts and then the Confederate vessels, which sat at anchor beyond. It seems that the Confederates were at least aware that this was going to be the next logical move for their enemy. But without Hollands, there was no coordination in their small fleet. In the early morning hours of April 24th, the assault would commence. Union vessels were able to move past the forts and the disorganized Confederate fleet before the alarm was truly raised. Confederate captains provided mixed reaction. Some would chase the Union vessels, others would abandon theirs, escaping into the swamps. The CSS Manassas, who you remember from the Head of Passes, would search for a ramming target. CSS Governor Moore was able to inflict damage on the USS Varuna, which caused her to sink before the remainder of Bailey's ships open up on her, in turn destroying the Rebel Defense Fleet member. At one point, the USS Hartford, having dispatched a smaller Confederate vessel, was set upon by a tug pushing a fire raft. A shot from the Hartford sunk the tug, and the fire was extinguished. CSS Manassas was disabled and destroyed by the USS Mississippi in the continued action. River obstruction and fire from the Louisiana turned several Union captains away, but the damage was done. Farragut successfully carried 13 of his 17 upriver. One was sunk while three turned back before passing the forts. Three River Defense Fleet ships were burned as the action commenced. Four, including the Manassas, were gone. The CSS McRae and the CSS Louisiana were still intact, along with two more. Casualties were 184 for the U.S. Navy, while combined between the Rebel forts and Navy, probably showed more like 150. Having successfully pushed on past Jackson and St. Philip, Farragut would move his 13 further to the city of New Orleans. A second line of Confederate defense was easily bypassed, mostly because the 14 guns only had around 20 rounds each. Lovell would thus begin evacuating the southern forts, deciding to concentrate on Baton Rouge. Men and supplies were carried away. Believing capture inevitable, the CSS Mississippi was put to the torch rather than risk the ironclad falling into enemy hands. Farragut would successfully capture the city. Duncan, along with the two forts, would avoid surrender for a few more days. Some of the defenders would mutiny, though, after Porter's call for surrender was rejected. Some would take to the swamps and escape. Benjamin Butler had landed troops in the quarantine behind St. Philip, making the writing on the wall clear. Duncan would surrender to Butler's troops, arriving to occupy New Orleans on May 1st. The Confederacy had lost its biggest city and key port for shipbuilding. U.S. naval operations would see there being a light at the end of the tunnel towards complete control of the Mississippi River. While maybe not mentioned as frequently and smaller in scale compared to the big land battles, in many accounts this is the beginning of the end of the Civil War. We can call it quits for today, having done really quite a lot. We backtracked a little and talked about the action at Dam Number 1. There was continued action in North Carolina with the Battle of Camden. We had the Partisan Ranger Act of the Confederacy 
which will be repealed in 1864, but would not cease the partisan activity throughout the war and beyond. Finally, and probably most importantly, we had the capture of New Orleans. Next week, we will talk about the movement on Corinth and backtrack just a little bit with the great locomotive chase. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week. <laughs>